deposed in a military coup, sent to jail and forced into exile. Former Pakistani leader Nawaz Sharif makes a triumphant election comeback. Can he lead the country away from its troubled past? This is Inside Story. Warm welcome from me, David Foster. It is a nation where the years since independence have been dominated by military coups, assassinations and to this day instability. And Saturday's elections in Pakistan were themselves set against a backdrop of intimidation and attacks by the Taliban. But the people of Pakistan defied the threats of violence and turned out to vote in record numbers. And the result should see a civilian government hand power over to another for the first time in the country's 66-year history. Nawaz Sharif has declared victory for his PLMN, or Muslim League Party. He's expecting a big lead, but not an overall majority. And he'll need to build a coalition. There's a tight race for second place between the Movement of Justice Party, or the PTI, headed by the cricketing hero Imran Khan, and the Pakistan's People's Party, dominated by the Zadari and Bhutto families. Voter turnout for the election is said to be close to 60%, well up on the 44% last time in 2008. Well, Sharif's popularity is largely confined to his native Punjab province. It's home to nearly 60% of Pakistan's 180 million population, and it is the most developed, it is the most prosperous Contrast that to the troubled regions bordering Afghanistan and Iran. Balochistan, for example, occupying 44% of Pakistan's total landmass, has just 5% of the population. Then there are the tribal areas where the government has little control at all, and the Khyber area of the far northwest. Well, Inside Story has correspondence in Karachi, in Sindh province, and in Peshawar, the capital of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. But first we hear from Imtiaz Tayyab, who is in Lahore, in Punjab province. Well, I'm here in the provincial capital of Lahore. This is the stronghold of Nawaz Sharif. In fact, we're just outside of the house of Nawaz Sharif, the home he keeps here in this province. Now, Nawaz Sharif, of course, the man claiming that he's won this election, that he is going to lead Pakistan through the many crises that it faces. Still, many people here, of course, in a celebratory mood. They've been celebrating since late Saturday evening, since Mr. Sharif announced that he'd won this election. And many people here are very much looking forward to the future with Nawaz Sharif as their possible leader. The Election Commission of Pakistan has said that Karachi's elections weren't free and fair. Now, at least one seat has to be repolled because of allegations of voter intimidation and vote rigging by the main political party here, the MQM. Now, the MQM have traditionally got around 19 to 25 seats. That's kind of the number that we'll be looking at in this election. Now, it's said that you can't make a national government without the support of the MQM. But with these allegations of voter rigging and intimidation, the election election isn't over here yet. There are very many political parties that have uh, a huge amount of problems with the MQM. One of them, the Jamaat Islami, pulled their candidates completely out of the election, saying that this simply wasn't fair. However, in Islamabad, in Lahore, in the power centers of Pakistan right now, they'll be looking at what to do with Karachi, whether they do make a coalition with the MQM party, which traditionally has always been part of the government, or whether the MQM party decide that it might be better this time around to go into opposition and be part of a strong opposition. It's all to play for here in Karachi, and by no means is the election over yet. Despite the threat from the Tariqa Taliban, Pakistan, that they would sabotage the elections, attack the polling stations, the people came out in large numbers to vote in this war-torn province, which has seen a devastating wave of deadly bombings over the past decade. Now, the people of this province have decided to choose the Pakistan Tariqa Insaf 
headed by Imran Khan to be the new government in the province and also uh, the gains they have made on the national level have put them in a very strong position as the second strongest party uh, in parliament. Now importantly, the people of the province rejected their own leadership, sending them home, defeating them with a very large turnout and with a very big and decisive margin. However, the Pakistan Tariq in Saaf, which will now uh, form the government here in the city of Peshawar and be the government in the Khyber Pukhtunkhwa province, will have to deal with a number of challenges, particularly arising from the conflict with the Tariq Taliban Pakistan, the problems in Pakistan's federally administered tribal areas, and of course, of turning around the economy. So let us bring in our guest on Inside Story in Islamabad, Musharraf Zaidi, diplomat and advisor to the last government in Doha, Rasul Baksh Rais, author of the book State, Society and Democratic Change in Pakistan. And joining us from Islamabad is retired Pakistani Army General Talat Massoud. Very good to have you, all three of us, uh, on this program. Let me let me start with you, Professor, if I may. In terms of the biggest challenge facing Pakistan, would you care to give us the, the number one on your list? I think number one is terrorism that Taliban Tariq uh, Pakistan has been engaged in, because uh, without that stability, order, and peace. Pakistan's government cannot move forward on its agenda of economic reconstruction or uh, inviting uh, foreign uh, investment into the country. I think that is number one. The number two are uh, uh, multiple economic challenges that the government is going to confront. And the most important one is energy, because uh, of lack of energy, thousands of industries in Pakistan are closed and hundreds of uh, thousands of labor uh, liberal are uh, unemployed. So I think uh, e economic reconstruction, uh, number two, but I think the most important one is how to end insurgency, Taliban insurgency, and suicide terrorism uh, in yeah. which the Taliban have been engaged in. Well, let me, let me put that uh, question to, to General Massoud, a military man who's presumably had his share of battles with insurgents in, in Pakistan. Uh, General, what do you think it, Nawaz Sharif will do that will be different to his predecessors and, and how can he be successful in bringing any Pakistan insurgencies to heel? Well, I think um, the greatest failing of the previous government was that uh, there was hardly any input from the civilian side and it was uh, completely delegated to the military leadership to handle and tackle the militancy situation. As a consequence, you truly did not have the support of the people. And there was so much of confusion whether we were fighting our own war or we were fighting the American war. So we hope uh, that uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif's party and uh, after the experience that we had of these years, the civilian government will be equally involved because, you know, uh, well, as will you he are say, well for aware, example, will he say it's time to end the drone strikes? No more. Well, I think this would be one of the major issues, but not necessarily the prime issue because, uh, you know, the internal uh, military, uh, I mean, the militancy situation is not totally dependent on the uh, drone issue. It is one of the issues, but uh, there are many other factors which have made the Taliban very powerful. And even if the drone, drone strikes stop altogether, uh, the militancy will still remain in Pakistan and will be the foremost challenge. Apart from the Tehrik e Taliban Pakistan, there are other also militant organizations which are sectarian and ethnic in nature, uh, which are also a great challenge to the state and have a nexus uh, with uh, the Tehrik e Taliban Pakistan. I, I, want there to, are those I want to put a couple of those points before we move on, General, to um, Musharraf Zaidi, um, who was, as, as we mentioned, advisor at some point to the last government. Let's talk about the militancy first of all. Um, why maybe you don't agree with this, but why is it being suggested that the previous government um, stood back from tackling the insurgency? Was it perhaps because when the, the military went in in force in 2009, it was such a spectacular failure? Uh, what's your thought on that? I think this is uh, what, what's happened in the last five years in terms of the coherence with which Pakistan has 
countered three separate things which are all interlinked. The first is there is a extremism problem in society. That's really an ideas thing, but it is a problem because it has a manifestation on people's behavior. The second thing is terrorism, which are direct acts you know, against innocent citizens, against innocent targets that are meant to terrorize. And the third is an ongoing insurgency in a part of the country that, ha that has had an obfuscated and confused uh, role within the constitutional framework of what constitutes Pakistan and what doesn't. So there is an extremism, a terrorism, and an insurgency problem. So, so when Imran Khan says, um, who did pretty well, maybe not as well as he would have liked in this election, when he says in the tribal areas where there's a lot of... Um, disquiet. There are about a million armed men, he says, but only about 10 to 20,000 of those are militants. If we win them, the armed men, which make up a million over to our side, our tribal people will, will win the war. Um, is he correct in that, that it needs just simply to be tackled on that basis of dialogue? I think, uh, I think it's a little more complicated. I, I wouldn't take away from the fact that, uh, certainly because of the way where we've ended up after this election, you know, this election uh, was partly about a total rejection of the Taliban in terms of what, they were, the, what they've been saying and what they were trying to impose through fear uh, in terms of democracy. So the people of Pakistan have chosen democracy. But they've done something else that's quite interesting, which is that they voted in large numbers for the two parties that prefer to talk to the Taliban in addition to use other measures rather than the other parties which prefer to fight with the Taliban in addition to other measures. So the burden of focus under Nawaz Sharif and under Imran Khan is likely to be on dialogue and that's something that has been part of the discourse in the, I, in the, in the run up Can the I ask you because of your association with, with the previous government why you believe this was not necessarily an election of, of Nawaz Sharif which Obviously, it was technically, but it was a rejection of the Pakistan People's Party. Uh, that that uh, the reason for that it has to do more with uh, the domestic situation than with the war on terror or the problem of insurgency or extremism or terrorism. Uh, the reason for that is simply that people are experiencing. 12, 13, 14 hours of load shedding a day. Inflation is through the roof, and there isn't really. When I say through the roof, it's 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 not it's not hyperinflation, but there people people feel it's harder and harder to buy the basic goods, and there isn't any job growth. So fundamentally, the people of Pakistan have felt that the last five years haven't been a great success in terms of governance, and they wanted to give uh, this uh, this new party uh, a different. Well, party, let's a okay. Let, to, let's push that on to, to Professor Rais. How long, if if Nawaz Sharif manages? to pull together some kind of government. How long uh, will people give him? How, how patient will they be? I think there are uh, some structural issues of the economy. If he starts addressing from day one, and he should be, particularly energy crisis, um, circular debt, and uh, tax taxation reforms, and other economic reforms. If he starts uh, focusing on economic recovery, it will take some time. I think uh, people are going to give him at least a um, couple of years to restructure the economy and, uh, excuse me, and bring Pakistan back on its rails. And uh, more than that, I don't think there will be any patience. People do understand that the problems Pakistan has accumulated will uh, require hard decisions and also some time, wisdom, and building national consensus, which uh, Nawaz Sharif is quite capable of doing, but I think it'll take some time. Nawaz Sharif, uh, the man, let's take a closer look at who he is. The 63-year-old's been Prime Minister of Pakistan twice before. In the 1990s, he won huge popularity in 1998 when he made Pakistan a nuclear power. But just a year later, his tense relationship with the army broke down completely and he was deposed in a military coup led by General Pervez Musharraf. He went into exile in Saudi Arabia in 2000, came back seven years later. His PMLN party came second. That was in the last election in 2008. And he favours liberal economic policies and has called for peace talks with the Taliban. Uh, what about the people of Pakistan? Maybe those who voted for him, maybe those who voted uh, for his opponents. A couple of comments from Karachi and from Lahore now. The masses have voted for Nawaz League, making them successful. Now it is their turn to fulfill the promises they made to the people. They should now act according to the people's expectations so that the masses prosper and peace prevails in the country. A lot of hope is there, but I don't see any dreams come true. The hopes are there that the inflation will diminish, employment rate will improve, 
the worries end and the power cuts end but nobody can do it these people are not capable of doing this uh, General Masood, let, let me put this one to you because we were talking about Nawaz Sharif's relationship uh, with the army. It went spectacularly downhill um, at the time of uh, Pervez Musharraf. And, and it has been suggested that the military still don't quite trust him. Is that a fair assessment? Well, I, I think um, they realize that their, the past has not been very pleasant, in fact, uh, very tense, and uh, there have been very serious. Uh, differences between the military and Nawaz Sharif, which led to the coup and so on. But I think both realize that they need to work with each other. And this realization is definitely there on both sides. And they don't want that there should be tensions this time. And I think signals have been passed and there is some sort of an understanding which has already taken place that they will uh, try to bring about a relationship which is mutually beneficial uh, uh, institutional wise, uh, institution wise, as well as for the country. So what we are hoping is that uh, they, both the military leadership as well as the civilian leadership and particularly Mr. Nawaz Sharif has matured over the years uh, and uh, are likely to sort of conduct themselves in such a way. And, and when we saw, furthermore, I'm sorry, when we saw the, the head of the military going out to vote and inviting the cameras to record him doing so, w was that a statement of a military man saying, I am actually on the side now of democracy and, and here's the proof of it? Absolutely. And uh, this is not the only indication that he has given. Uh, in the past, uh, he has made certain speeches in which he has categorically supported democracy. And at the same time, I think there is no other choice for the military now but to support democracy. Those days have uh, gone past when the military could interfere and intervene directly and uh, assume power. Uh, I think new centers of power have developed. The monopoly of the military uh, ha has uh, is no more there. So I think they do realize that. And then they also think that it is in the interest of the country to sort of strengthen democratic institutions. No doubt they were worried the way that the previous government and uh, the civilian leadership was conducting itself, the way uh, it was extreme poor governance, and at the same time, corruption was so pervasive. So I think those factors were there, which uh, did uh, raise concern in the military leadership. But nonetheless, they stayed away from uh, in directly interfering. And I think even in policy matters now, both in terms of foreign policy as well as defense, uh, I think uh, I'm expecting that the civilians will be far more assertive than what they have been in the past. And I think the military leadership realizes that, and they will show that flexibility me, uh, to allow them. Let here. me put a point that you've just raised to, to Mr. Zaidi there ab ab about corruption. I was looking at um, a record called the Transparency Index, which, which measures how corrupt a country is by, by a number of different factors. Uh, in 2010, Pakistan was 143 on the list of about 170 countries. Uh, 2011, it had bettered itself slightly, still 134. Um, it's pretty poor still, isn't it? How does anybody go about ending that? Well, I think this is, you know, one of the sort of core challenges for governance is to find a way to address the issue of corruption without making it look like it's political victimization. And this is not an easy task. In fact, if I was other than civil military relations as being really the primary cleavage in Pakistani polity over the over the course of its history, the second biggest and most vital sort of cleavage is this the, the disjoint between wanting to end corruption and ensuring that the way that we ad address corruption, the way that we try to end it, doesn't create uh, political victims that can then use that sense of victimization to generate votes and come back into power. So and part of I it is about directing right. funds in, in the right direction as well, isn't it? Because the country receives a great deal of overseas aid and an awful lot of it, we understand, is, is funneled away from the projects uh, to which it is supposed to be going. So, so when we talk about the power outages and what is it, 15 hours a day sometimes in Lahore, how do you make sure the money gets there, that the job is sorted and that the people's patients doesn't run out. How, practically, how do you start with something like that? 
Well, I think, frankly speaking, you know, I think the powers of technology and, and globalization have already started doing the job. And, and Pakistani civil society, the media, uh, and indeed, you know, newly empowered uh, institutions like the judiciary, who, who are there, all, all are there to hold people in positions of executive authority. They're there to hold pe those people uh, to account for what they're doing. So the behavior of public officials, uh, without a question in my mind, has changed, despite the fecklessness and corruption of the previous government, the space in which they had to operate was dramatically shrunk from the kind of free-for-all uh, sort of Western-style shootout uh, of, of corruption and misgovernance that was taking place regularly in the 90s. So I think this is really an issue of uh, democratic evolution and of strengthening of institutions. And the one really positive factor that's coming out of this election two factors. One you already mentioned, the large numbers of people that spoke for this system, for the system of democracy as being Pakistan's future. And the other is, of course, the involvement of young Pakistanis, mostly very angry young Pakistanis who've seen so much of this corruption and really feel like, you know, they're, and, it and has who to want end to it, so see, they become politically engaged. I, I'm absolutely certain that they, they want to see political settlements to, to long-running problems. And Professor Rais, uh, one of the longest running sores, one of the, the most open wounds is, is Kashmir. Um, how can Nawaz Sharif try and heal uh, the, the divisions with India over that? Is that going to be one of his priorities anyway? I think it is going to be one of his priorities because uh, he is the architect of peace process between India and Pakistan. Way back uh, in 1997, when he had two-third majority, he started the peace process and he was seeking uh, out-of-the-box solution on the Kashmir issue. And today but, but then he, he went and tested a nuclear bomb, which was hardly likely to, to encourage the peace process with India. Well, it was in response to what India had done, and this peace process started immediately after Pakistan tested the nuclear devices, and the two countries were very much close to uh, a negotiated settlement when um, Pervez Musharraf and few military generals enacted the drama of Kargil war with India that, that derailed the process. What he has been indicating in recent years is that peace with India is the key to economic recovery of Pakistan. And, 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 and the uh, economic recovery, if I go to General Massoud on this one too, because the cost of keeping all of those troops uh, on the Indian border, stationed uh, also on the line of control in, in Kashmir, is an enormous drain on the Pakistani economy. Yeah, absolutely, there's no doubt about it. So I think uh, it would be a game changer if our relations with India improve. And that would have such a salutary effect all round, in fact. Um, you know, it will uh, improve the economy. It will uh, give us the opportunity of reducing uh, our forces. It will also, um, we will be able to focus more on the internal threat uh, of insurgency rather than uh, look towards the east. Uh, and also, if you can really go a little deeper, one will realize that today the threat from India is also because of the internal threat that Pakistan faces, uh, because it is the same militant groups which yeah. really uh, go and attack India, and in turn, India then uh, becomes hostile towards Pakistan. Just a very so quick thought, gentlemen, if, if I could um, ask you to be very brief on this, because we haven't got too much time. Um, General, starting with you optimistic that the, the democratic process has been given a chance, another chance in Pakistan, are you? Well, I would say that uh, I'm optimistic. Uh, I think things in Pakistan have changed and uh, the political leaders and the institutions uh, have matured. And I think um, uh, I'm seeing a, a definitely a better future for Pakistan. Professor course, Rais, I'm going to uh, have to move it on. It's your turn. Optimistic about uh, democracy, that it has a future? very optimistic about uh, democracy in Pakistan and I think this was a historic election in which uh, the voter turnout is the highest. People are very excited about democracy and uh, they have defied um, all danger, all mm -hmm. fear and all acts of terrorism and have voted in great numbers. I think Pakistan is um, at uh, the crossroad where it leads to much more stable, orderly and prosperous <laughs> Pakistan. Uh, brevity, no, never a strong suit of our guests on Inside <laughs> Story. We thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mosharraf Zaidi, sometimes when there's an election in a country such as Pakistan, there is a feeling of dread. Is, is, is that absent this time? 
The, no, there's no sense of dread. I think there's a lot of optimism and hope for the future. And I would say democracy wasn't given to Pakistanis. Pakistanis have taken it, and they've taken it and held it very strongly on the May, on the May 11 election. They've really proven that this is a system that is the choice of the Pakistani people going forward. It is fascinating. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much indeed to Musharraf Zaidi, Rasul Baksh Rais, and Talat Massoud. Thank you. Uh, for watching this edition of Inside Story, you, you can find this edition and more at aljazeera.com. Just follow the links for programs and Inside Story. You can leave us your comments there too. From me, David Foster, and the rest of the Inside Story team, thank you very much for watching the program. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.